connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. Welcome back to Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Uh, this is our first webinar of the new season, and I'm Lisa Stromquist, your host for the next hour. Uh, Spark Live is where we gather each Wednesday to curate, convene, and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community. Our goal is to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Since we're live, I just want to remind everyone, you do have the opportunity to type questions into the question box at any time. Uh, so please don't feel you need to wait until the end of the presentation before you start uh, entering your questions. Also, feel free to share your thoughts on Twitter and be sure to tag us at Child Health Cam. Uh, before we get started today, I did want to remind everyone about uh, the Children's Healthcare Canada's annual conference. Connecting Health Systems for Kids. It's December 8th to 10th here in Ottawa, and early bird registration closes on September 15th. So we have a great event planned. Uh, it's moderated by Andre Picard and Dr. Christine Chambers. Uh, some of our keynotes include Zaina Kaya and Mayan Zib. Uh, there are plenty of panels, concurrent sessions, a poster fair, hospital tours, uh, networking and social events, and uh, we just hope that you'll join us here. So to, on to today, um, just a reminder, September 13th is World Sepsis Day. And so we're really excited today to welcome three individuals from SickKids to share their journey uh, from the evolution of a sepsis screening um, protocol in the emergency department to clinical pathway development, uh, spread to inpatient care units, and the recent development of EPIC tools to support a reliable approach to sepsis recognition and management. So our pre presenters today are Julie Watson, a nurse practitioner, Division of uh, Hematology and Oncology at the Hospital for Sick Children, Amanda Ellenberger, registered nurse, professional practice coordinator, the Hospital for Sick Children, and uh, Dr. Deborah Schoenfeld, Assistant Professor, Department of Pediatrics, University of Toronto, and uh, Staff Physician of Emergency Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children. So I'm just going to pass the microphone over to the Sick Kids team and uh, and uh, listen to this. Uh, we're going to learn a lot more about their sepsis protocols. Our slides are not, um, uh, they're not living. Oh, oh there we go. go. Okay. All right. Back in action. Okay. So we'll just um, jump right in and go over the goals and objectives for today. So at the end of this talk, um, we hope that participants will be able to understand an approach to improving reliable sepsis recognition and management in a tertiary care pediatric center, recognize challenges associated with implementing and sustaining a hospital sepsis program. So to maintain full transparency, we'll discuss some of the, some of the challenges and roadblocks we've encountered identify approaches to knowledge translation, quality improvement and program evaluation, and associate the need, uh, excuse me, appreciate the need for national collaboration to standardize sepsis data collection and benchmarking. So just a, a word about kind of tips and lessons learned. So we have embedded some of our lessons learned throughout um, the journey in this presentation. And we do, the purpose of this is just to kind of um, inform you. And we, we really do hope that some of these tips, tips will prove helpful uh, to your respective teams. 
So I won't belabor the point too much. Most of you kind of already are convinced of this and know that sepsis is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the pediatric population. Mortality rates in North America are in the 4 to 10 percent range, but actually truly a lot higher than that, probably closer to 20 to 30 percent in complex care patients and in cohorts that are in the intensive care unit. For a number of reasons kind of listed there, we also know that over the past several years, there's been an increasing prevalence in the rates of um, severe sepsis and septic shock. And then finally, we know that early recognition and timely management with uh, adherence to internationally recognized guidelines leads to uh, improved patient outcomes. So, you know, sepsis protocols or so-called bundles have been associated with improved outcomes for children. Um, so, all right. Um, this is kind of a, a bit of a high level overview of our journey and the associated um, sequence of events. So in this session, you're going to hear about our journey from the evolution of a clinical pathway development and sepsis screening in the ED to the spread to inpatient units and ongoing development of EPIC tools to support a reliable approach to sepsis recognition and management. And really, the QI literature demonstrates that pediatric sepsis improvement efforts have overwhelmingly focused on the emergency department setting. And, and this really, especially to me uh, as an emergency department provider, really does make sense. So first of all, in a sense, you get the most bang for your buck uh, in the emergency department. So we know that the majority of patients who develop severe sepsis will present first to the ED, which is the major gateway to the hospital and higher levels of care. And the care that these patients receive in the first minutes to hours profoundly impacts their outcomes. Outcomes. Second, the ED is kind of like its own uh, microsystem within the larger, uh, much more complex hospital macro system. So although chaotic and unpredictable, it's often easier to implement change in a 30-something bed outpatient unit than it is in a 300-plus bed inpatient unit with 10 different wards. And that comes with its own um, host of challenges, which Julie will um, talk, um, explain more in a little bit. So, you know, our ED, uh, our sepsis initiatives at SickKids really started in our ED as well. So a quick look back to 2014 reveals that at the time, we did not have a standardized pathway for managing ED patients with septic shock. There was significant inconsistency among providers regarding fluid administration strategies, antibiotic selection, and laboratory evaluation. And there was no systematic way to identify patients with grossly abnormal vital signs or other risk factors for sepsis. What we did have was a sepsis-related sentinel uh, event, which was the death of a previously healthy five-year-old female over several hour time frame uh, in our emergency department from what turned out to be group A strep bacteremia. And this event was called Sentinel because it really, you know, it's, it signaled the need for immediate investigation and response. And indeed, this was the event that prompted um, our executive leadership at SickKids to really demand changes in the ED and throughout the hospital. So um, in the fall of 2014, um, we really um, started to look at recent cases of septic shock from the ED and, and it was helpful for us to kind of create uh, visual timelines of care for these cases. So I'll present a couple of cases to you now. Important to kind of highlight, these are 100% real cases um, of patients we saw and um, kind of real timelines. So the initial case was a 15-year-old male who presented to triage with fever, vomiting, and decreased energy. And you can see from the timeline, he arrived around 827 in the morning. Um, 10 minutes later, he had his first set of Vital signs. He was found to be febrile, tachycardic, had an initial blood pressure which revealed hypotension. An ER response was activated, and this was um, this is where kind of a bell rings overhead, and a bunch of providers are brought immediately to the bedside for resuscitation. He quickly got IV access, got some fluids administered, received um, broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, and you can see that basically his antibiotics and fluids were delivered kind of in well under the one hour goal uh, time frame. And he was admitted um, and treated uh, uh, very well for what turned out to be an episode of E. coli urosepsis. So all of this to show, you know, when we do it well, we do it really well. But I think it's important to kind of contrast this with a case of a child who was seen not 40 days later in the exact same season. Um, similar, a 10-year-old female presented to triage with fever, sore throat, and abdominal pain, who presented around 4.40 in the afternoon, 10 minutes later also had her first set of vital signs, was found to be tachycardic and tachypnic, had no blood pressure measured, not because of any um, uh, mistake that any nurse made. This was simply not a part of our um, triage vital signs at the time. It was a busy night, so this patient was put back out in the waiting room for a couple of hours. Um, later that evening, when she was brought back into a room, she was found to be persistently tachycardic, tachypneic, and now frankly hypotensive. You can see it took some time to establish IV access, 
to deliver fluid boluses, uh, and there was a market delay till she received antibiotics and vasoactive agents. Was ultimately admitted to our intensive care unit where she requ required a couple of days of ECMO treatment. So um, you can see here kind of the drastic time difference from um, time uh, to, you know, from recognition that there was clearly something wrong to delivery of appropriate treatments. And important to highlight that both these patients that I just showed you were seen during daytime hours. They were both triaged by highly qualified uh, nurses and evaluated by pediatric emergency medicine trained physicians. So why then does one have a blood pressure measured immediately? Why is there an ER response uh, response in an immediate staff eval in one situation and not the other? And why does it take 10 times as long for the second patient to get antibiotics? So we knew from these cases, and there are dozens more where these came from, that we had to reduce this variability and increase the reliability of our care. So sharing these stories kind of brings me to our first tip from our experiences. So in order to convince and prove to people that this is indeed a big enough problem to merit major changes, you're going to have to engage your audience. So there are a few things that are more powerful than real stories of real patients in your local environments. So exposing system inadequacies or quality and safety problems by highlighting cases that didn't go so well is, is generally not something we're typically comfortable with in medicine, but this is especially necessary because there's often a large disconnect between how well we think we perform and how we actually perform. So, you know, especially if you come from a children's hospital, you're likely to get a lot of pushback and hear things like, we don't have a problem here. We see 70,000 children a year. We know how to identify the sick ones. But real cases can really provide some pretty dramatic evidence to show that change is necessary. So um, we can get, you know, a lot more uh, granular, but the truth is in the interest of time, I think we have to stay big picture. This is one of our um, very early um, driver diagrams when we decided to tackle um, this idea of reducing sepsis morbidity and mortality. So you can kind of see here that there was four main um, key drivers and each of, for each of those, there was kind of a collection of, of change strategies and interventions that were proposed. Um, needless to say, there was a lot of work to be done and really kind of a at the time, lots of reasons why maybe this wasn't kind of the, the best time to start the work. So that really brings me to my second tip here, which is that you just have to jump in and begin. So, you know, maybe your hospital has no pediatric sepsis resources. Maybe you have a pathway, but you don't have a recognition tool. Whatever the case, you are here and listening because you've decided that your current system isn't working as well as you'd like and you want to institute some changes. So some of the best advice I was ever given is this idea of begin before you are ready and start where you are. So there'll be a million reasons to wait and start at a more ideal time. So um, for us, at one point, our department leadership was in flux. Uh, maybe in the next year or two, your hospital is changing EMRs, or maybe you know that there's simply you know no 100% uh, validated tools. So you think that, you know, it's better to kind of wait for that time to come. So um, I'll urge you to kind of begin now. And even the most, quote, unsuccessful attempts at change will, will be um, uh, helpful to future efforts. So going back to this driver diagram that I showed a few moments ago, uh, we decided actually to start with our third driver, which was to increase um, adherence to um, the PALS or American Credit Critical Care, American College of Critical Care Medicine guidelines for septic shock. We did this because we kind of thought it was a bit of like low lying fruit. We decided this was kind of easiest for us to start here. And we also realized that there was no use in identifying um, children with, with severe sepsis or septic shock if the treatment goals thereafter were not clearly outlined. So um, first we had to define and set the standard of care. So we formed a small committee in the emergency department. Initially at this stage, it was mostly doctors and we reviewed the literature and designed a clinical pathway that was consistent with existing guidelines. This um, also, really importantly, was really the start of our attempt to standardize the language and communication around concerns for sepsis. So we really, really wanted to create a common language or sort of like a catchphrase, so to speak, that communicated a clear concern for sepsis and kind of delivered a sense of urgency. So this was the first time we introduced the idea of what we now call a sepsis alert, which you can see kind of listed in the first kind of blue box at the top of this algorithm. This is um, uh, just a copy I'll just kind of briefly whiz through of kind of one of our earliest paper um, order sets when we were back when we were still on paper, which kind of goes through um, suggested laboratory evaluation, fluid and medication administrations for pa patients who um, uh, are exhibiting signs of severe shock and, sepsis sh and septic shock. 
So back to this driver diagram. So I mentioned that we started with our third driver, but in, in all honesty, um, we knew um, that early recognition of sepsis was a major obstacle to protocol implementation and definitely the most high yield driver, but by far the most challenging because it involved system redesign was, was how to hardwire uh, recognition and escalation of care. So we'll focus on this kind of for, um, for the remainder of my section of this talk. So most of you know that there's um, no specific blood test or diagnostic tool to reliably diagnose sepsis every time. So um, a heightened awareness of the basic signs and symptoms is critical. Now, uh, this is kind of tip number three uh, from us to you. Please do not reinvent the wheel. So um, you will notice that, you know, you, most of you probably know there's a lot of screening tools that are already out there. The basic elements of all these screening tools are really the same, and they include um, signs of infection, age-specific vital signs, signs of impaired perfusion, and the presence of comorbidities or high-risk conditions. Um, what you should not do, I would say, the only major no-nos are to just go ahead and kind of quickly um, just adopt an adult tool with no uh, age-specific vital signs. Or if you work in the emergency department setting, probably not very wise to adopt a tool that puts a lot of emphasis on laboratory values, uh, which are not likely to be available in many cases, especially early on in an ED course. So again, sticking with this idea of kind of not reinventing the wheel, I'll just kind of present to you um, a couple of screening tools which are uh, out there that you may or may not be familiar with already. On the left, you can see the screening tool from the Pediatric Septic Shock Collaborative of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Our screening tool was um, uh, actually based on this screening tool. And on the right side of the screen, you can see the CAPHC screening tool, which um, you can find on the Children's Healthcare Canada website, which was released in 2015. So this was the initial triage algorithm, um, what our initial triage algorithm looked like at SickKids. So the more, most important part, I don't, hopefully you can kind of zoom in here, but the most important part is this kind of pink box, which basically asks the triage nurse to assess for the presence of um, abnormal vital signs, perfusion abnormalities, and high-risk conditions, and kind of generates, asks the nurse to generate a score, and kind of based on the presence, um, based on that score and the presence of certain high-risk criteria, a um, sepsis alert should be generated. You'll see it asks questions like heart rate in the red zone. So our previous EMR automatically, it was lovely, kind of automatically categorized vitals as uh, white, pink, or red, which um, reflected normal, somewhat increased, or significantly increased heart rates, respectively. And this were based on CTAS guidelines. So if your facility uses paper charting, it would be perfectly reasonable to use certain heart rate cutoffs for infants, toddlers, school age, and teenage patients. Our, our inpatient sepsis pathway, actually, which you will see soon, uses this um, simplified approach. You'll also notice we had to specifically request a triage blood pressure measurement for tachycardic patients. This was a significant practice change at the time for our group. And then finally, the last big practice change is, uh, that this entailed was a rapid MD notification and patient assessment to determine if the sepsis pathway or order set was needed. So this was a lot of change for our MDs and RNs, so we had to be sure that we were thoughtful about informing and educating our frontline providers. So to heighten awareness, an educational campaign was extended to all uh, emergency department personnel and took place in the form of presentations during divisional rounds, MD business meetings, nursing meetings. We offered uh, nursing workshops. Um, these are actually mandatory workshops, um, largely uh, revolving around rapid IV fluid administration uh, techniques and uh, preparation of vasoactive uh, medication infusions. Uh, our guideline was made readily available throughout the emergency department and we sent out regular email updates on changes. And finally, perhaps most importantly, we sought regular feedback from frontline providers when we first introduced the screening tool and every version thereafter. So before we went live with any change, we created mock scenarios to conduct usability testing to ensure that our designs were functional and user friendly. And we conducted surveys to gauge satisfaction. And we continue to welcome email and in-person feedback. And I will tell you, not a week goes by where we don't get tons of feedback. So although the paper tool was a great way to start, um, by this point, our nurses were now documenting electronically on a new electronic um, system, which was EDIS or Emergency Department Information System, and asking them to fill out a paper form was not neither reasonable nor very effective. So we knew we had to go electronic so we could keep our frontline providers happy and actually systematically track our screening rates, which we had not been able to do until this point. So this, again, was kind of a, a sort of a broad overview of our driver diagram when we initially decided we were going to make the transition from paper to electronic screening. 
Um, this is kind of what um, an initial version of our electronic screening looked like in our old EDIS system. So um, a nurse um, would um, enter the vital signs and be guided through a series of questions, which you can kind of see here. Um, and then this is what it looked like when a sepsis alert was generated from triage. So this big bright red banner popped up automatically. So everyone in the ED would be notified when there was a potentially sick patient in a room. And the goal of this was to bring the medical team to the bedside to promote a quick assessment or what we started to call a sepsis huddle to ensure um, that all MDs and RNs involved in the care of this patient um, were aware that sepsis was in the differential diagnosis. So my next tip is another important one. So whenever you're asking people to adopt a change, it's important to keep them engaged, involved, and updated. So communicating and celebrating the wins, even the early small ones, is really, really important. So this was our driver, um, our run chart, I should say, um, showing the rates of documented sepsis screening pre and post introduction of our electronic screen. Now, truth be told, in all fairness, it looks overly impressive because we intentionally chose to leverage a forcing function in our electronic medical records so that our triage nurses could actually not complete or close out triage without the sepsis screening being done. I should also mention that the percentage the percent of eligible patients with the documented sepsis screen that you can see here on the y-axis was the first sepsis related indicator to be included in our hospital quality improvement plan back in 2016 and 2017. When we introduced the triage screening we also tracked time to complete triage uh, and we were excited to show our nurses that the screening had not significantly prolonged the time it took to complete triage for patients. And then finally, um, this is an example of kind of emails that we were sending out during our audit and feedback phase, during kind of the, the early phase of, of introductions of our sepsis initiative, where we sent provider level feedback on sepsis cases that were seen in the ED and really celebrated um, cases that went well um, with specific details around kind of real, real patients from our local environment. All right, so just when people were starting to get comfortable with one electronic medical record, we had to change EMRs. So at this point, our group was so familiar and reliant on our sepsis screening that it was designated one of the one of the few top priorities for our epic go live day. So our, our team was really reliant on this and kind of sort of learned to, to love this new system. So um, we had to kind of somewhat quickly think about how we would design a new one. So over a six month period, we had the opportunity to design a new BPA or best practice alert, which was similar, but in many ways better than our existing tools. So for starters, it was largely automated. So it leveraged a lot of the information that the triage nurses had already uh, put into uh, the medical record. So less manual components. It was well integrated into existing nursing workflow and it was applicable throughout the ED course. So our first alert was really just designed to work at triage, while this BPA was designed to work and activate and trigger throughout a patient's ED course, because as you know, patients can develop sepsis well beyond their time in triage. And then finally, this alert, as you will see in a second, had both uh, nurse and doctor uh, components to it. So um, this is kind of a broad level uh, overview of the EPIC uh, best practice alert um, that we designed for the emergency department. It was largely kind of a, a, a two-stage alert, if you will. So the way this works is the triage RN would enter the patient history in an, inf an infectious screen, enter some vital signs into the EMR. And um, if the patient was found to be um, febrile and tachycardic, kind of the first stage of the BPA um, would uh, pop up here. And this would prompt the nurse to evaluate for um, presence of high-risk condition, impaired perfusion, or impaired mental status. If the nurse uh, acknowledged that any of those criteria were present, the second stage of the alert pops up, which is uh, what we call the sepsis alert, which um, uh, prompts the, uh, or reminds the providers that now this patient meets criteria for a sepsis huddle. And I'll show you a little bit about kind of what this looks like. So this is um, basically, I call this version 3.10 because you know we continue to kind of modify this week to week and kind of month to month. But this is an example of what would pop up for a patient who was seen in our triage with um, an example here of a pulse of 190 and a temperature of 40 degrees. The nurse would be asked if any of the following criteria are present. If he or she deemed that any of those criteria are present, um, he or she would be asked to press the bottom left hand button, which just says activate sepsis alert. If that is activated, this would be the second stage of the BPA that would pop up, which is the actual sepsis alert, saying that the patient meets criteria for a sepsis huddle and would prompt the RN to notify um, the attending provider, or in some cases, if the staff doctor is not available, our charge nurse uh, instead. 
And then when the doctor logs into the chart, he or she is needed is met with this BPA, which is a MD specific BPA, which basically prompts the doctor to do an evaluation of uh, the patient and determine um, if a sepsis pathway is needed. So you'll see here, and I'll, I'll circle back to this in a few moments, that the physician, physician would decide if the patient was a code sepsis or a critically ill patient requiring a full sepsis pathway. A sepsis watch patient, which is a patient um, maybe exhibiting some early signs of septic shock, but not kind of fully there just yet. Um, uh, or if this was a patient with really no concern for sepsis currently. So maybe this was a patient who had received a ton of ventilin and, and, and was tachycardic secondary to that. So this is what our tracking board kind of looked like in these scenarios. So if a sepsis huddle was indicated, a red, ex uh, red exclamation mark would show up next to the patient's name on the visual tracking board that the entire emergency department could see. And this um, would indicate that this child needed a quick assessment. If a physician decided to press on the code sepsis, this um, exclamation mark would turn into a red S. Uh, sepsis watch patients are labeled by uh, orange uh, boxes around an S. And then, you know, if the MD decided there was no concern for sepsis, the entire icon would disappear and routine management can continue. So kind of what we know at the moment right now, um, just to give you kind of some idea of kind of um, how this is impacting care. So on any given day, uh, approximately 7 to 10-ish percent of our patients, so within a 24-hour period, will trigger the first stage of the alert. So that's fever and tachycardia. Keep in mind, the large majority of these patients, the alert will be shut down after that because they will have no high-risk conditions or signs of impaired perfusion. About 20 to 25 percent of those alerts make their way to an MD and require a sepsis huddle. That's anywhere from three tends to be more closer to three in the summer to six uh, on a really busy 24 hours. We felt like these numbers are very reasonable considering our volumes in the emergency departments. For those patients who trigger from triage, our provider initial assessment times are very rapid and certainly kind of a lot lower than um, comparison CTAS to patients. Um, although we don't have the exact numbers for sensitivity and specificity, what we do know is that this is a screening tool designed to be overly sensitive, and we know there will be lots of false positives. We do know that about a third of our um, MD alerts or patients who require sepsis huddle ultimately are discharged home, and these numbers are really in line with um, a lot of the other literature out there for other institutions who have emergency department alerts. So some of our lessons learned kind of really quickly. The first, I will say, is that uh, in both adults and children, the systemic inflammatory response criteria have been criticized for their broader inclusion of mild symptoms and lack of specificity. And indeed, we have also found um, that, especially in respiratory season, um, the inflammatory triad of fever, tachycardia, and tachypnea is very common and often flags kids unnecessarily. So our newest alert actually took um, tachypnea out of the alert and really focuses on more on signs of impaired perfusion. The second thing I will say is that the initial clinical picture is not always obvious. So it's not always black and white. And asking our providers to do an assessment of a child and say, okay, is, is it sepsis or not? Is not is not is is oversimplifying things a little bit. So that's really what prompted us to in, to um, introduce this two tier system that I just showed you, which differentiates code sepsis from sepsis watch, and really allows our clinicians to be a little bit kind of unsure about those kind of high risk patients who are tachycardic and label those patients sepsis watch patients and keep an eye on them. And then finally, I've alluded to this uh, before. I would say whenever possible, remember to leverage existing resources. So we probably unnecessarily spent a lot of time and effort creating our BP from scratch when we didn't need to. Um, there's lots and lots of great resources um, in Epic Foundation that you should definitely um, look for and use. And then the last thing I will kind of end on was some of the challenges that we faced in the emergency department. So as I've already alluded to in the kind of short four to five years that basically we've gone through all of these changes, our, uh, we've gone from paper to one electronic system to a second electronic system. We really haven't been in, in a real significant plateau phase kind of since all of this started. So that, that has proved challenging. We continue to kind of um, battle with this idea of kind of alert fatigue, where there's kind of a, a delicate balance between making sure we catch all patients, but not over bombarding our um, clinicians with alerts. So we continue to work through kind of glitches in, in our alerts um, to minimize alert fatigue. Um, there are still manual components of our BPA, which are prone to human error. So we have to ask nurses to identify high risk conditions. We are currently working on embedding all of that within um, EPIC so that um, our EMR can actually do the identification of those um, things for us. 
And then finally, I would say um, really that the biggest challenge has been um, data collection for us. So um, first off, we have struggled with how we define severe sepsis and septic shock. And there, as you may know, various strategies used for case ascertainment. So there's research definitions of sepsis. So these are the 2005 Goldstein criteria. There's administrative definitions or ICD-10 codes and clinical judgment sort of definition, so to speak. So these are physician documentation of sepsis or delivery of predefined sepsis treatments. And the strategy use varies from institution to institution and study to study. So this lack of consensus or gold standard has been problematic for many centers um, involved with this work. And then I would say next, um, this work is very resource intensive. And um, we, like many, many centers out there, lack some of the support and resources for identifying a correct cohort, as well as reporting required variables. So accurate capture of sepsis patients and characterization of each encounter typically requires creation and interpretation of EPIC reports, as well as loads of manual chart review. So the approach is quite resource intensive. But now that we have survived kind of our first year in EPIC, we're hopeful um, that we will have the resources Sources to create some of these meaningful reports. And as you'll hear in the next part of this talk, we now have an action plan for defining and tracking some of these outcome and process measures. So on that note, I will kind of pass the talk over to Julie Watson, who will take over. Great. Thanks, Deb. Um, so um, we are going to now transition to our inpatient unit, um, talk about a clinical pathway development um, and implementation and education uh, sort of delivery um, process that we went through. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about sort of um, some enthusiasm that we have around the development of um, inpatient sepsis BPA um, tools, um, hopefully coming soon. So here we go with the inpatient um, and a warning to all, this is going to sound really low tech uh, compared to what Deb just spoke to us about, because we do not have any of these electronic um, sort of alerting uh, tools. Um, so, but that's okay. Um, it still, um, I think, hopefully will provide some um, tips and strategies um, if this is kind of where you're at as well. So um, thinking again about sort of, you know, what was our motivation and prompt um, to do this work, uh, going back to about uh, 2016, which was when we started on the, for the inpatient areas, really thinking about uh, quality improvement for sepsis, um, our sort of uh, um, uh, survey of the landscape showed us that we really had no standard or guideline for sepsis care. Um, there was no inpatient sepsis screening modality. Um, we did not have embedded sepsis order sets. Um, we did have an electric EMR at that time, um, but no specific order set for sepsis. Um, and there were um, around that time, 2015, early 2016, three more sepsis related sentinel events um, that really sort of uh, kicked off um, uh, and kicked off our um, deeper dive and our exec and our executive um, sort of, you know, demand um, for some work here. This just shows you um, some of those sentinel events, and this includes the one that uh, Deb alluded to, um, plus um, a, a couple of others. And you can see that uh, these events uh, occurred across our inpatient medical and surgical units. So themes from our uh, serious safety events, um, uh, so in that deeper dive and that root cause analysis, um, these were some of the main themes that were common um, across these cases. There was delayed recognition of suspected sepsis, some delays in administering fluid resuscitation and antibiotics, a lack of timely escalation, so escalation for MRP uh, notification and assessment, um, uh, delays in escalating for um, IV access, um, and delays in engaging our critical care response team or that clinical expertise um, to assist with the patient um, with shock at the bedside. And really, I think, was highlighted and um, really came through strongly um, as well was gaps in communication or poor situation awareness um, and, um, and clear communication about a concern for sepsis, a patient who um, had received some treatment for sepsis and perhaps de deserved increased monitoring um, or further consultation, um, but that sort of communication um, for further action um, was was um, sort of missed or um, or not um, strong enough. 
So within our um, hospital at that time, we were also embarking on a major patient safety project. Um, we call it Caring Safely, and this is in association with the Solutions for Patient Safety. Um, and so within our new definitions of these Sentinel events that we were calling serious safety events, um, all of these um, uh, uh, causes of harm um, fell into that category of preventable harm. So we knew that um, what we needed to do was to sort of look at, you know, um, why was there so much variability in practice? Because while we had these sentinel events, there were many, many cases where patients were recognized um, appropriately and treated for sepsis and care was escalated and that sort of, you know, right treatment, right time um, was able to be delivered. So alluding to what Deb was talking about in terms of, um, you know, removing this unnecessary variation in practice, hardwiring some aspects um, and um, encouraging an adherence to some standardized guidelines was really where we wanted to go. So um, the, these prompts um, forced the creation of our sepsis steering committee. And as we initially sat together to talk about how will we embark on doing some quality improvement work for our inpatient areas, um, these were some of the points that we came upon um, that made us uh, recognize that there was going to be some significant differences from the work that was done in our emergency department to how we would approach this on the inpatient areas. So screening, you know, for a, a sort of a low frequency but high stakes um, condition like sepsis or septic shock, um, you know, when and how would it be appropriate for us to do screening? We had bedside pews or a, an early warning um, system uh, that is a score uh, related to patient sort of acuity or changing acuity. So we wanted to leverage this um, and certainly there was no appetite to add an additional sepsis score. Um, so leveraging what we had. In our EMR, we knew that we didn't have um, the, the ability to have an automated sepsis alert, um, but what tools could we leverage within that? We knew we could embed order sets and links um, to our sepsis pathway guideline for um, that access for providers um, to assist them uh, in the moment. Um, we knew that building provider capacity um, and maintaining that capacity and skill on units would be challenging and different from the ED. You know, in the ED, a smaller population of nurses and also um, a much more sort of frequent exposure to, um, uh, to patients with sepsis and um, probably a, a more in-depth resuscitation uh, training and practice. Um, and we knew across our inpatient units, there were some areas who had more familiarity and had um, probably you know, different capacity um, from one unit to the other, um, other units where sepsis might not be a very frequent event at all. So that unit to unit variability extends also to you know, provider models. What is the access of um, nurses at the bedside to their um, physician providers, um, different uh, populations of patients um, who are more or less at risk for sepsis and what sepsis might present like in those uh, patients, and also processes. So availability of empiric antibiotics on the units and, um, a, a, and standard equipment, um, say for a rapid fluid uh, bolus delivery. Um, there are inconsistencies across areas. Um, it, there was some concerns about some unclear escalations. An example of this was our um, IV access or uh, the STAT IV access request. What was that sort of consistent way to escalate? Um, it was not clear in the association. And so that prompted some other work to be done to clarify some of those escalation processes. We knew we had some conflicting and overlapping other clinical practice guidelines that we wanted to harmonize. And we also um, started to think about how we would um, sort of incorporate or choose at this time not to incorporate um, our NICU and PICU uh, and day hospital areas. So again, sort of wanting to keep this um, pretty high level, um, uh, this is our initial driver diagram um, and our main goal uh, was to eliminate preventable harm from sepsis. And you can see that um, our primary drivers within this are very similar 
to the diagram that Deb showed you. So um, a reliable uh, approach to recognition, timely and consistent management, um, and really streamlining and hardwiring some of these processes. Uh, like in the emergency department, we chose to um, hone in on our sort of adherence to a standard guideline and creating that expected response um, and uh, educating and training uh, inpatient teams to build that capacity to deliver care. So here's where um, I'll sort of talk about one of our tips, um, and this will relate to the development of our, uh, our inpatient sepsis pathway. Um, the uh, like fo our focus was to identify some of our local and in, in situ barriers to performance and then design a guideline that would address some of these um, processes um, and remove barriers to um, you know, delivering the right care right. So embedding some processes to make it easy for providers to do right things right and hardwiring these where possible. So just briefly, because um, we can certainly make this available for folks after the presentation, I just want to show you what our inpatient pathway looks like. So this is um, uh, the, um, the pathway exists in a sort of fold card kind of in hand tool. It also, of course, exists electronically. Um, and this is the front side of the page if you were looking at it in hand. Um, and it, the front side focuses on uh, recognition. And so here's where, uh, like Deb, Deb described, um, we focus on um, the identification of patients who have some uh, uh, indication of clinical uh, change, increase in acuity, or some deterioration. And if those patients um, have um, a known or suspected infection, um, then it prompts providers to use a uh, stop, think, act, review um, uh, process to um, think through, is this patient with a high risk condition for sepsis? Um, and to then focus on uh, a comprehension, comprehensive um, perfusion assessment, including uh, mental status abnormalities, um, perfusion abnormalities, and not just uh, blood pressure. Um, that was one of the things we knew there was um, sort of uh, a, um, a a default to think about you know, a patient with sep severe sepsis or septic shock must be hypotensive, but trying to get providers to move away from that and think about really um, perfusion. So that's just a bit about um, the recognition pathway. Um, one other thing I would like to point out was um, the embedding of um, a structured communication tool using SBAR um, for uh, providers to communicate with each other about a concern for sepsis um, and to create that, si that situation awareness. So this is the management pathway, um, and you'll see it looks um, quite similar to the um, emergency department one. It really mirrors <clears throat> the ACCM PALS guideline, um, but we um, sort of embedded a few prompts to sort of, you know, hardwire some of those things, um, such as um, opening the sepsis order set, um, there's a uh, empiric antibiotic um, selections um, and moments for escalation just as a sort of prompt or reminder um, of some of those critical time points um, in that first hour management. So here comes to tip number seven, um, and that goes back to the use of that structured communication tool, um, SBAR. So using structured communication to create situation awareness and a shared mental model. We really recognized as we embarked on our education and doing lots of team training, as we um, implemented the education across our inpatient areas, the importance of saying sepsis. The importance of using also simulation to practice that effective team communication and using SBAR um, and trying to also encourage providers um, of how to embed this clear communication um, into handoffs and transfers. 
So implementation, implementation of rollout to units, and again, I'll just sort of touch on this um, quite briefly. Um, we, over a six-month process, rolled out a um, sort of um, unit engagement, embedding processes and awareness, as well as delivering the education bundle um, to all of our inpatient units. Um, and we used a lot of the exact same tools um, as the emergency par department had used. So um, our traveling roadshow of presentations to engage staff and make them aware of the new pathway, um, email blasts, um, unit visits, talking with staff, um, delivery of the education bundle. So um, using that train their trainers um, uh, model for sustainability so that ongoing education um, would flow from that. Um, uh, lots of that in situ and interprofessional simulation. I can't really overstate the importance of that team training. So embedding processes, as you see there, there's a number of strategies that we used. This was really key um, in terms of um, looking at culture shift and changing people's language um, so that when we all thought about sepsis, we had a sort of a shared mental model um, of our pathway, of the expected response, and of, of the um, patient safety language that we wanted to use. So the education bundle, um, this was uh, what, uh, what was selected um, in our 2017-2018 year as one of our hospital quality improvement um, indicators. And it was around the uh, completion of the education bundle for our inpatient RNs with a goal of 80%. Um, and that education bundle, as you can see there, included um, a, an, an iLearn or an electronic pre-learning session, a didactic session, some standard work where nurses could practice um, a standard technique to deliver a rapid fluid bolus, as well as reconstitute and administer stat antibiotics, simulation um, for recognition and management, and practice using that SBAR communication, um, and an extensive evaluation process of that education um, to help um, um, uh, adjust and improve it as we went along. So over our implementation, uh, these were all the staff who received um, that training exposure. And I think just I wanted to shout out the importance, again, of celebrating successes. Um, so we were able to meet our hospital QIP indicator. You can see there in the bottom right hand corner. We um, continue every year to celebrate September as Sepsis Awareness Month. Um, our team um, was nominated for an award um, for this this work in the in the rollout of that education. Um, and in there, it's difficult to see, but we there's an example of an email that was um, sent during the sort of you know first um, six months or so after implementation. When we would hear about a case, we would do a review and send that audit and feedback to to the teams. So what we know, um, so through this process and ongoing. Um, uh, these are some of the um, sort of since then what has happened. Um, so we know that we have had uh, one further uh, inpatient uh, SSE related to antibiotics, not a death, um, but it, there was a delay in antibiotic delivery. So a deeper dive into that has prompted us to um, recognize that education sustainability and the quality of that is really important. So re-education, uh, re-reminding folks of um, some key components of the pathway and the resources um, available to um, ensure sort of, you know, um, appropriate delivery of care. Um, we've also realized that maintaining some bandwidth to keep going with this work can be really challenging. Many competing organizational priorities, I, I'm sure everybody listening um, can relate to some of that. Um, we had you know, our, our transition to EPIC, our EPIC upgrade, our real focus on some of our hospital acquired con uh, conditions, our HACs um, and CLABC in particular. Um, so, you know, how do you sort of keep your foot on the pedal and, and maintain some bandwidth for this work? Um, we recognize that we have some uh, a fairly poor uptake of our order set. And so doing a deeper dive into sort of why that might be and how we can improve um, data like uh, Deb had alluded to. And I won't sort of reiterate what the challenges are there, uh, but we are having some more struggles. 
Um, so our move to EPIC um, is really promising um, for some of the sepsis programming, as you've heard from the ED, but also now going to inpatient. Um, and we are um, going to be able to move to an automated uh, screening um, alert, as well as some additional tools um, within EPIC. So I think two of the um, most important uh, things that have come out of our work is really we have a palpable culture shift. You know, activate the sepsis pathway has become common language within our teams. Um, and the recognition of a centralized sepsis team at SickKids um, who are promoting this ongoing quality improvement work. And there, I will um, pass it off to um, Amanda to continue talking about our quality improvement. All right, thank you, Julie. Um, so mm -hmm. we're just gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna spend some time walking through our inpatient sepsis quality improvement plan, including uh, our goals and measures. So. Here you'll see our five-year strategic plan for the inpatient sepsis program. And as Julie had discussed, our inpatient clinical pathway was developed and launched in 2017. At that time, the data available was from our previous electronic health record, KidCare, um, where we were able to receive automated reports of sepsis orders that use and critical care response team consults with sepsis as a concern. Our team would also review sepsis-related safety reports and visit units throughout implementation of the pathway. Um, and as you can see, we followed a similar trajectory to the emergency department with the transition um, from electronic health records. So with ours from Kid Care to Epic. Uh, and in saying that, up next is the development and pilot of the Epic Sepsis Best Practice Alert. This will require a team focused on building the BPA, validating the BPA, and developing a process for a team huddle and alert reconciliation once sepsis is suspected. Uh, as you can see, SickKids adopted a big bang approach to EPIC in June of 2018. Um, and this meant that our current data collection of suspected sepsis events via kid care and CCRT consults were unavailable. And we operated for a time with minimal data. It's taken time to recognize that how we can best use the functionalities within EPIC to provide us with a smart data set. Um, so this is where we're at right now. We have established a pilot team working on implementing the BPA on a general pediatrics unit. I'll take a closer look at this soon, but first let's, um, let's review our drivers for our inpatient sepsis program. Um, so our primary drivers are to support reliable recognition and alerting for sepsis and to provide timely and appropriate management of sepsis through adherence to best practice guidelines. Um, as you can see, in order to best meet our goal of eliminating preventable harm from sepsis, the next step is to implement an electronic sepsis alert. Uh, so the team of clinicians on the general pediatric unit that will be working on the pilot um, include the senior unit manager, a staff physician, an EPIC specialist, our sepsis physician lead, sepsis project lead, and sepsis clinical project lead. And once the BPA is operational in inpatient units, we will need a process for utilizing the data to inform ongoing unit-based QI initiatives and an audit and feedback process to clinicians as required. Uh, with the added functionality of reporting within EPIC, the data will be available for local units to review on an ongoing basis. So let's have a look at what process and outcome measures we will plan to be collecting. Um, our process measures will include percentage of BPAs with provider reconciliation, meaning that the provider has received the alert, assessed the patient, and has made a decision about escalating the concern for sepsis, uh, time from first BPA to huddle, order set utilization, time to antibiotics, time to first fluid bolus, and the percentage of patients who have a, a blood culture and serum lactate drawn. Um, so our outcome measures will include incidents of hospital onset severe sepsis relative to BPAs fired, uh, number of safety events related to sepsis, ICU transfers associated with sepsis, ICU and hospital length of stay associated with sepsis, code blue or unplanned transfers for sepsis, and mortality with sepsis as a leading or contributing cause. Uh, here's just some more details. Uh, for what we'll be using for data collection. Uh, so time zero will be the time that the BPA first fires to the clinician in EPIC. Time to huddle is defined as time zero. 
uh, to the BPA being reconciled by the provider. Hospital onset is defined as a patient admitted to an inpatient medical or surgical unit for greater than 24 hours. And the unplanned transfer definition will be based on data from our critical care response team. So as Deb mentioned earlier, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Connect with other organizations who have had success with what you're trying to accomplish. Or if you're an organization that uses Epic as your electronic health record, you can find out a lot of information through Epic user web webinars. Our team was fortunate enough to visit Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio this past July. Uh, in terms of the EPIC sepsis BPA, Nationwide was able to share their immense expertise in the development of the sepsis BPA and workflow, which we will use to model our program here. They were able to share their local team or their local program structures within each unit, uh, who was responsible for collecting sepsis metrics and reporting to the organizational level. Uh, and Nationwide also shared their process for the huddle development, including their successes and challenges, which we will keep in mind when we develop our process here. We learned a great deal about the QI plan at Nationwide. Um, we learned about the PDSA cycles they completed when implementing the sepsis BPA, uh, and we had we're able to gain an understanding of how data was collected and um, the understanding more about their metrics was a focus of our visit. Um, so now we can anticipate data collection and analysis resources that we will require here at SickKids. Uh, Nationwide shared insights into their data validation methods. They were clear about what we would need before beginning our journey to the sepsis BPA on inpatient units, um, which has given our program clear direction on our next priorities. Um, as you may be able to tell, our colleagues in Columbus are leaders in this work, and they were quite an inspiration to our team. Uh, so here's a peek at what's coming up in our sepsis journey. Some of uh, our next steps in sepsis QI work include developing that program structure, so engagement of the steering committee to uh, update drivers, metrics, and our QI plan, establish inpatient teams with representations from uh, physicians, nurses, and quality leads, um, and to sustain momentum throughout the organization, we will require support from leadership teams to review cases of sepsis, investigate the root cause, and to share feedback with clinicians in their areas. Um, we'll also need to process maps, so we will need to understand the current process for when sepsis is suspected, and uh, to develop our huddle process among bedside clinicians to reconcile sepsis BPA. Uh, to accomplish this, we plan to schedule sessions with the pilot unit team, including nurses, um, clinical support nurses, staff physicians, residents, to identify the clinical workflow for assessing, and assessing the patient and documenting. Uh, EPIC BPA build and validation. So our EPIC ClinDoc team is busy working on building the sepsis BPA for sick kids. Once completed, we will need to validate our BPA before turning it on for clinicians on the front line during our pilot on our Gen Keats unit. And from there, we will work to roll out the BPA to other units. Getting the EPIC best practice alert operational in the inpatient setting is our first step towards providing clinicians with support in recognizing and treating sepsis, but this won't be the end of our sepsis program. We will need to continue to work with clinicians to ensure the BPA is firing for the right patients and at the right time. Um, as has been a challenge in other organizations, we anticipate that we will similarly be met with challenges re related to spreading the use of the BPA to unique patient populations. So uh, pa patient populations such as cardiology or hematology oncology will require a separate validation to ensure their patients are accurately captured within the BPA algorithm. Um, and while we have our work cut out for us, our team here is uh, highly motivated and very excited to embark on the next step in improving uh, sepsis care in our inpatient units. Uh, okay, so we'd like to take this time. You guys have, everyone has heard from us. Um, uh, that if there are any, we'd like to take the opportunity to learn more about you or any questions you may have. Great. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, we're really near the end of our time, so we'll just do a few of these. Um, one of them is, is sending bud culture before starting antibiotics still part of the protocol? Uh, uh, I 
Yeah. So I think in ideal circumstances, the simplified answer to that would be yes. Now, that being said, I think everybody would agree that if that gets in the way of timely delivery of care, delivery of um, treatments such as antibiotics should never be delayed if uh, blood cultures are not easily obtainable. But it's still considered kind of um, kind of the highest quality of care to obtain blood cultures when possible. Agreed. And same for our inpatient pathway. So the um, sort of teaching to teams um, was that if there was sort of, you know, any um, significant delay um, in um, sort of delivering the sort of next um, uh, stages, that we would not um, hold um, antibiotics for our culture. Great. Uh, so another question. Were balancing measures included in your ED and inpatient sepsis QIPs? And if so, what measures did you use? So uh, I can speak to initially, kind of when we initially rolled out our um, screening, I think I, I showed one of the run charts for one of our initial balancing measures was timing of uh, triage. So when we introduced screening, we were unsure whether this would dramatically increase um, the time it would take for nurses um, to triage um, patients. And we see up to, you know, 300 and something patients a day. So this was not kind of a trivial thing. So that was one of the initial balancing measures which we were able to show um, uh, didn't, you know, was not actually um, a founded fear. I think um, when it's a great question, when it comes to kind of um, going forward, certainly we're, um, things that we are considering looking at are going to include um, false positive uh, rates uh, when it comes to screening. And then very closely related to that, I would say would be kind of um, over treatment and over resource utilization. So, you know, in, in the era of antibiotic stewardship, where we are all kind of hyper aware of uh, not using um, antibiotics unnecessarily and when there is growing and mounting evidence that um, overhydration um, of, of children can be harmful as well and lead to kind of prolonged ventilator times and so forth. Um, these are all uh, metrics that um, undoubtedly we will have to um, try and uh, track as well as we uh, implement our sepsis screening. Thank you so much. I think we uh, could spend a whole day talking about all of this and um, and everybody has so many questions and, and it, we we're right at the end of our hour here. So if people have other questions they'd like to ask, uh, you can see Deborah, Julie and Amanda's um, uh, contact information up there. If you don't, uh, if you're not able to jot that down or find it, uh, you can forward it to us and we can forward your questions along to the SickKids team. So I'd really like to thank the three of you for a wonderful presentation. And like I said, I think we can, check back in on your progress from time to time and uh, see how things are uh, uh, developing. Um, right now, um, I'd just like to, again, thank everybody. Thank uh, all of our um, um, folks online and uh, let you know that we have some exciting uh, presentations coming up over the next several weeks. We're going to be focused on putting kids back on radar for the upcoming federal election. So we have a series. Um, you know, to stand up for kids, stand up for Canada. Um, it will begin some, September 18th with a primer on getting kids back on the radar. And this will be followed by Raising the Bar, the Path to Safer Medications, and Indigenous Health, Pursuing Reconciliation, and Child and Youth Mental Health, a national discussion on the readiness to change. And also just a, a reminder, again, of our... Um, of our conference in December, December 8th to 10th here in Ottawa, Connecting Health Systems for Kids. So again, early bird registration is closing soon. So uh, we hope that you can uh, join us here. And another reminder to sign up for our Children's Healthcare Canada Spark newsletter. That way you can stay up to date on all of our activities and events. So thanks again for joining us today and we will hope to see you at the conference here in Ottawa, or at least uh, have you on our webinars uh, every week. Bye now.